Great. Thanks a lot, Brian. Welcome, everyone. Um, what this presentation is designed to do is familiarize everyone with kind of like the latest update that was just sent out in the tech note. Uh, Jerry was Jerry sent that out to all of Central Region, and I think every office has installed it. Um, if your office hasn't, it's due December 16th. So I'm going to just make some highlights to all the changes. Uh, one change you got was an updated, the latest version of the, the task formatter. That version was dated uh, May 31st. It's developed by DSD out in Boulder. And uh, they're the people that we are, that are developing a national level task formatter. And so they're working on the next version. We'll be testing that out as soon as they can release that. And then as soon as it's tested and it moves into the operational mode, we'll be sure to share that with everyone in Central Region as well. This last task formatter just has a few minor bug fixes. And then also we went back or we changed the default weather rules to exclude Prob 30. This is in a, a, because of an overwhelming response from all of you offices in Central Region. Many, many of you uh, contacted me and said, hey, look, I don't, we have an, a local office policy. We don't use Prop 30s here um, unless you absolutely have to. So anyway, we changed the default weather rules um, for everyone. But know that your office has the ability to make changes to those. I'm going to get into that in just a minute. One more change that was set with the latest tech note were some visibility um, changes. Now visibility is rounded to the nearest usable value for a task. Before it would go, it would once you ran Aviation Finalized, it would set your visibility to 3SM or 5SM, but never 4SM. We changed that, so any, any value that you can put in a task, it will be rounded to the nearest kind of whole number or whatever valid task value is there for you. Aviation, Aviation Finalized does that and also Consort. We also set the max visibility to be 7SM in Consort. Uh, this is so that the color scheme can be consistent on NDFD. Notice in this graphic across the country, Central Region has the, the top end of their visibility limited to 7 by default. And uh, this will just help for a uniform um, color scheme with NDFD at this time. Aviation Finalize already did this, so it's, it's not a huge change for everyone. The graphics I'm looking at, I was able to pull up in AWIP. The address here, or the address is posted right here on this web, on this uh, presentation. And if I look at these NDFD graphics in AWIPS, we had a, a big storm across almost all of the hit, affected almost all of Central Region at the end of November. This deep low that went through is sat in the Dakotas. And um, it produced very low ceilings all over the upper Midwest and Great Lakes and uh, low, low visibilities as well. And, uh, this is what the NDFD picture looked like. And I would have to say it, it looks really, really, really good. Um, this is exactly what we're looking for. Most of you, if you're not operational, you started with con short in the background, and that was your that was default that was sent to NDFD. Um, it's a great starting point for synoptic systems, the, the systems that have IFR. We'll get into why that, exa that is exactly, um, but the having a common starting point gives us a consistent picture in NDFD. So speaking of consistent picture, Consort is our starting point right now. That's what goes to NDFD. Um, there's this website from headquarters. Uh, it's called Veri Veritas. And um, you can get into this. The web address is at the top. You need your username and password. It's your, your NOAA 
NOAA login credentials. Um, the top left is the NDFD picture, what's being sent out. Um, and the top right is actually what the National Blend of Model, which is still under development, is producing. The bottom left is the HER model output, and the bottom right is the GWAMP output, and this is visibility. I captured this from the, this is the 4Z Monday, so what was going on in the middle of the night. And it, it really gives you an idea of what, what the National Blend of Models is going to end up looking like. You can check out this website at any time. If I want to pull up the METARs, this was from 15Z, so quite later, but um, you can see how there's a widespread area of dense fog. There is some low visibilities up in North Dakota. And uh, so earlier on, the models were showing these things as well. As I said, I would show you the new weather rules. Um, it has a lot of VCTS, and uh, if you have likely or categorical, the task formatter will spit out um, tempo or VCTS in your outer periods of the task. Notice that thunderstorms are handled totally separate from showers or other um, precipitation, showers, snow, whatever, from other precipitation. And this is what's defaulted for some reason, but your office has the ability to make changes to the weather rules. You have, you can change your task definition file, your local definition file. And there are instructions in documentation that are linked in this PowerPoint and linked on the CR doc toolbox. All right, so one more thing that was released with this uh, tech note was a new smart tool. We at the MKX office were given a tip from someone at the Marquette office, and uh, you know we collect tips from lots of offices, so send, send your ideas our way. But we were made aware of this smart tool that was originated at the Greendale Spartanburg office, created by Pat Moore, and was originally called Low Cloud Height. We didn't change anything with this tool except the name call it cloud-based from CCL and LCL. What is nice about this tool is by using it, it actually seems to work a lot better than that cloud-based from RH tool that we have out there available for you. That's because it's using the CCL, um, and the CCL is really what determines the cloud base for diurnal Q. Remember, con short, um, kind of struggles with diurnal cue on those nice summer weather days. So we found the smart tool really, really, really helps us out. So we, we dove in um, and went, we went all in on it. I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, it also, the tool you can find the LCL or you can plot where the LCL is using this tool. Um, now it, since it's a smart tool, it's not in the populate menu, it's in the edit action dialog box, or if you right click like on the cloud-based primary weather element on the map itself, right click and it's available in that menu. Well, we like this tool so much, but we also, you know, we want to consider the aviation cloud-based from RH tool. So, Jerry wraps it all into one procedure, which is very, very slick. Um, that is in your populate menu called Aviation Cloud-Based From. What it does is it wraps those two tools together into one, and you, it gives you the ability to put values into either Cloud-Based Primary, Cloud-Based Secondary, or Cloud-Based Conditional. Remember, the secondary and conditional groups are very are optional, and the task formatter reads them um, in just different ways. Cloud-based conditional is still very experimental. It doesn't always perform what you would expect. We're working with the developers at DSD to get that um, perfected in the task formatter. 
But for now, I encourage you to experiment with it. All right. Well, we like that procedure so much that Jerry put it right into Aviation Populate. Um, so Aviation Populate now has a bigger GUI, as you can see, than what you were used to before. And we added just a couple of things. There's this option here saying only diurnal queue elements. And then down at the bottom, there's the section that was aviation cloud-based from procedure put right into the aviation populate procedure. And uh, so why, do you, why did we end up doing this? Um, Jerry's going to go into a little bit about why con short maybe might struggle with a few things and why we want to give you the ability to do this in a very slick way. So with con short, uh, the majority of the elements that are going into con short are actually forecasting ceiling heights. So diurnal queue may or may not be an actual ceiling. It could be a few or a scattered group that um, is at a different height level. And so the problem there is if you're only trying to forecast ceilings, you might not necessarily catch a lot of these diurnal queue events. And obviously, as a lot of you have probably experienced during the summer, um, this can be quite the headache. So we really wanted to be able to tackle this in a way that um, you wouldn't have to go too much out and run a lot of other different tools. So that's why we sort of threw this into Aviation Populate. Um, another thing to keep in mind here is you might be wondering, well, why are we even seeing that, that initial smart tool? Well, the way I'm computing this and the way I'm able to run this a bit faster is I've actually smart knitted um, a lot of these elements. So I smart knitted the uh, cloud-based CCL and cloud-based LCL. And so, and there's actually a couple models that even have cloud-based RH smart knitted. Um, so doing that, I had to choose defaults. And so if you're actually looking at the, the procedure or the smart tool, Marshall's going to go back here, um, this is the defaults that I chose. Um, now, obviously, the models can be, you know, are different models being smart knitted. Um, but they, these are the, the default that I chose. So if you want to go away from that, then you would, might consider actually running the smart tool. But if, you, but if you're fine with that, um, then you, know, you, can, you can go on. And one thing to know is the smart tool is really slow. It takes quite a while to run, and that's because it's really doing a boatload of computations. Um, so it, you know, that's sort of why we went down this path of trying to help you guys out and trying to get this diurnal Q element. And Marshall will get a little bit more into exactly how to run this procedure um, in, um, in the next couple slides. All right, so we're trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, I'm sorry if you think it looks complicated, but once you get used to it, it's very easy. Basically, you just have to make three selections in order for it to, hold on. Can I, Brian, am I still on? You're still on. Okay, sorry, I got some interrupted window. All right, so to run this, you're going to make three selections. You're going to select only diurnal queue elements. Notice in the top part of this, all, all these other elements are still selected. If you check mark only diurnal queue elements, it ignores everything else. All right, so that's good. Then what you should then what you need to do is select your time range in your grids and then select yes for you selected time range. And then down at the bottom, you select yes for diurnal queue day. I'm going to back up just a second on this idea. First of all, I would recommend run Aviation Populate with the defaults. It'll put Consort in for the whole half period. Just start with that. Then click just run, don't click run dismiss. Because then you can go into your, your uh, grids, highlight the time period where you think diurnal queue or some sub cloud base would be a good idea. And that's when you make your extra three selections in this aviation populate tool. Um, and, and then you run it again. So kind of walk through an example. Let's say that the default selections, which puts Consort into the cloud-based primary grids, gave me a bunch of high clouds. 
let's assume that the sky cover was actually greater than 57%. So this would give me, um, say, broken 250 in a tap. Well, let's say that, yeah, it's serous and it's broken, but it's actually a little bit thin. So we're getting some diurnal cue developing underneath it. So I'm going to go into that time period that I think diurnal cue are developing underneath it. And I'm going to make my three selections. Select only diurnal cue elements. Use selected time range. Yes, diurnal cue day. And I want it to go into the cloud based secondary group. I want to make a sub group for our task. Um, I just click run, and I only have one grid selected, so this is what popped in. And notice it gave me 6,000 foot cloud bases with the, using the CCL. And uh, let's say I like it and I run the task formatter from it. It's going to give me something that says scattered 060, broken 250. And that might be, I mean, hopefully that's what I wanted and that's what's going on in the observations or what I'm expecting in the near future for the task. Yep. So I wanted to um, add one more thing here. So a lot of what we're doing is we're trying to, you know, solve this diurnal cue issue by using other, you know, the CCL and LCL type elements. The hope is eventually once we get uh, the national blend, they're actually going to be providing us two different grids. They're going to be providing a ceiling grid and then a cloud base grid. So the hope is that cloud base grid um, will sort of get away from having to worry about all this diurnal cue and that hopefully the cloud base will, will forecast it. Now this is very early on in their developmental phase on that, um, but the, the grids are available and I'm hoping that we might be able to get that out to central region sites come the January, February time frame. Um, still got to work with some of the National Blend folks to make sure they're all right with that. Um, but that, that is the hope, and our hope is that, you know, that grid will be a, a huge um, help for our forecast offices. Thanks, Jerry. Does anyone have any questions yet? Brian, has anyone raised their hand yet? We can uh, open it up for questions. I don't see any hands raised, but please raise your hand. I will unmute your line if you have any questions over, uh, over the uh, call so far. Okay, well, um, no questions means everybody understands. I, I, think, uh, I think this has been a good explanation, um, and uh, this is one of those that's easier to do uh, than, than perhaps to explain. All right, we'll keep moving on then. Uh, there were some new models introduced within the last two tech notes, and uh, Jerry's going to go, go into more about what is involved and what you have available in your offices now. So here's a nice little slide that Marsha put together about the waves that go into Con Short. Um, this might be something that would be useful. I know I get oh. this question quite often. Pa pardon me. I think we're waiting. Are, are you trying to update your slide? There we go. Now, sorry about that, Jerry. If you want to, if you want to begin again, now we are seeing your slide. Okay. So. Sorry that you were missing the slide, but yeah, this is a nice little slide that Marsha put together that sort of shows the weights going in the cloud based primary grid. And you can see here um, in bold that GLAMP meld has a pretty strong weight. And in fact, a lot of the GLAMP elements, you, we also have a good weight for the lab as well. Um, so this is because those, those models tend to perform pretty well. Now the GLAMP meld, um, just for a reminder, that came available um, I think two tech notes ago. And what that is, it's a new sort of blend of the GLAMP and the HRRR. And it's a new analysis or a new blending scheme that um, they're using up at headquarters. And they're providing this uh, via the LDM and we're grabbing it um, from Central Region. So all sites should have that. Um, it, I believe it is only cloud-based primary or it's actually a ceiling grid again. So they're only forecasting ceilings. We call it cloud-based primary so we can get into the blending tools. Um, and as well as visibility. So you should have that for both. 
Um, another one that just came out in the latest tech note is the GFS one hour. And just to get in a little bit into the detail of this, this is actually exactly the same model as what you currently see with the GFS. It's a 20 kilometer model. Um, the difference here is we're actually getting um, hourly resolution. So when they're actually doing the model time steps, it's at a much smaller time step when they're creating the model. I believe it's every 15 minutes. And for sake of bandwidth, they only actually supply us with the three hour and six hour time steps. We're getting this hourly data, again, through a back door that they're doing at Central Region and going out to another site to grab the hourly data. Um, this is you know, going to be a huge help for Con Short, and I in immediately introduced it so it can help with some of the fragmentation issues that people were seeing with POPs and QPS. Um, and it also helps with ceilings and or call based primary invisibility. Um, I've also added hourly high res ARW and NMM data. And this has been available for quite some time, but again, due to bandwidth constraints, we haven't added it. But many offices now have much better bandwidth, so we decided that it was time to add it. And so your office should see this. Now there is a problem with the dew point, um, and that's going to be solved here probably in the next week um, with the NWS and its config. So hopefully we're going to get that out to all of you so you can start seeing hourly dew points. I believe right now it's actually completely missing due to a bug in the code. Um, ops model is um, it's actually been around for quite a long time, but it was buried within ConShort itself. Um, it's the model, it was the way that I include the OBS into ConShort. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to verify it. I wanted to get it out there so people could start looking at what was actually going into um, ConShort as a representation of the OB. And this is now getting into all your verification, and I've had, we'll share some verification later, and it's, been pretty insightful that now I can look at it to see what it's doing. And a brief idea of what OBS model is, for like temperature and dew point, I use a seven day running average of the diurnal trend. Um, and then for um, elements such as POP and QPF, it's actually an infection scheme. And I use the RAP 13 upper level winds to sort of infect some of the precip that is going in, in the OBS. Um, ConShort SD is a, a brand new model, something that is, was optional in this latest tech note. And the SD stands for standard deviation. And the idea here is a lot of offices have been saying, well, you know, this model is pretty much always bad. And why are we including it in the blends? And I didn't necessarily want to throw out a model all the time because sometimes um, it can appear bad but can, can actually be within the the distribution of the model set. So by using the standard deviation, you can, you can get an idea of what the distribution actually looks like. So three standard deviations contains about 99% of the distribution. And so what I'm doing with ConShort SD is at point by point basis, I look at the standard deviation and if the model falls outside of, I actually use two standard deviations because we have a pretty small data set, um, that it will throw out that model at that point. And then I recompute the, the blend, the average. So the idea here is for elements such like uh, cloud-based primary where you can have a huge difference. You can have mo one model saying clear sky 250 and another model saying um, 15, so uh, 1,500 feet. Um, that's a pretty big difference, and what this might do is if you have a whole bunch of models saying, you know, lower, and then one model on the high end, then it's going to throw out that high model, and hopefully that will improve the verification. And I'm getting, you know, a number of offices did sign up for the this optional look at it, and so I'm going to start looking at this verification. And right off the bat, um, just within the first month or so, I've been seeing that it has been verifying pretty well. So I'm excited about it. I think it, it could certainly help us out. So um, here's some of the verification. And um, were you going to talk about this? OK. So here in the verification, every office actually has this. Um, and you can see right off the bat that GLAMP meld and the ConShort elements are verifying pretty well. But what I really am excited about 
is in this first six hours here at MKX, you can see our forecasters are adding a lot to a lot to this. Um, they're they're improving upon the models and they're choosing the right times to actually override what is in con short. Maybe they're just overriding a couple grid points or whatever, but they're improving on it. Um, another thing I did want to point out, <laughs> the scores are pretty close. So if you look at that first time frame, um, GLAMP MELD is, has a high key skill score of um, 0.596, whereas Con Short's just um, 0.59, or 0.595. So it's just a thousandth of a point. So um, when you're looking at high key, um, you know, that, that thousand of a point is probably just a, a point or two, and that makes sense to me. They should be close because GLAMP MELD has a, a pretty substantial weight in the overall blend. Um, and the, here the forecast is, you know, they're, they're at 0.631. That's getting a little bit more substantial. And it gets narrowed down a little bit as you come down um, in the forecast cycle. And that's somewhat to be ex expected. Um, another thing that jumped out at me in this particular verification is OBS model is dead last. And so this is getting to be a theme through a lot of the offices. So, you know, we, we're not seeing it in the worst guidance or the best guidance in that first hour. But certainly after that, it, it jumps out as being one of the worst ones. And my, my thought here is I may have to adjust how much I'm actually weighting. Because it, it carries a pretty strong weight there in that second hour. So I may, I may have to reduce that weight of the odds model. Now, this is only for cloud-based primary. Um, but you know I'm looking at all of the elements to see what they look like. So this verification, like I said, it's, it's out there for a lot of people to see. Um, we can get a little bit more into it later um, and actually drive through some of the web page and um, help people see how you can utilize this verification. Yeah, we can go through some verification at the end. Okay. Um, is now a good time for questions, Jerry? Sure. Okay. I do have one question. Uh, um, here and um, let me see if I can unmute your line. Um, Jeffrey, your line is uh, uh, has been unmuted. Would you like to ask a question to Jerry? Yeah, I had a question earlier. Um, I want to get this straight so I can explain it to the rest of the staff. But the uh, the statement was made that the uh, I believe that the cloud-based primary is uh, the ceiling for the NDFD. Is that correct? In the in the NDFD, um, ceiling is actually derived um, from our grid. So we take the sky cover and then the cloud-based primary to get the ceiling grid. So that's actually done in a process and aviation finalized. And I think we have slides um, about that later on, maybe. Um, it's just a review of aviation finalized. Yeah, there's a review of aviation finalized that Marsha's going to touch on. But that's a good question. Yeah. Okay, so the, the ceiling is, is you the really ceiling should derive from uh, uh, two different grids then? Correct. The, the ceiling is derived from two different forecast grids. So it, it doesn't use the ceiling from um, Con Short or any other model. It uses a ceiling from um, or the call base primary from the forecast grids and your sky from the forecast grids to get this final ceiling. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay. I guess okay, thank you. To, to, I mean, the idea is you really don't want to ever edit a ceiling grid. What you want to edit is sky cover and cloud based primary. All right, thank All you. Right, that, that extra little bit helps out. Thanks. And now we have a call from uh, Matt Bunkers. Um, this may apply to uh, uh, to many. So, Matt, if you're able, I've unmuted your line. Okay. Yeah, Jerry, I was looking at your uh, verification, and you had GLAMP meld showing uh, the best guidance for a lot of that. Uh, I looked at our verification page, and I can't find GLAMP meld anywhere. So I suspect we must not have something configured correctly for that to be uh, being utilized. Uh, where would I check for that? 
Uh, well, there's a number of things. I mean, I guess the first place I would check is to make sure you, that you're getting GLAMP meld. And if you're getting GLAMP meld in, um, if you can check that box off, then the next step would be to look at the Boise Shore configuration and make sure that you have GLAMP meld listed in the, the save model. Um, in order for it to, and it's, you'd have to have it both in the Boise Shore configuration utility as well as the aviation verif config utility. I know that sounds weird, but the way I had to set it up was Boise Short does the saving, Aviation Barrett Config does the um, the actual computations that go on to this slide that you're seeing right here. So those would be the two first places that I would look. Um, and then obviously, if, if you can't find it um, after that, I'm always available. So um, you know, you could have Kelly or whoever um, contact me, and I can I can see where we where there might be missing configuration. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Yeah, no problem. And and Jerry, just from looking around, it, it looks like GLAMP meld may not be in the top three for every location, but there are many locations that it shows up highly. So uh, folks would want to make sure that, that it is um, uh, coming in and, and part of uh, uh, part of their verification. Yeah, and because it carries such a strong weight too, if if it's missing, um, then that's going to drastically impact what's in con short. So your con short could definitely be different than your neighbor's con short. All right, I see no additional questions. Uh, Jerry, if you'd like to go ahead and continue, and I'm sure we can uh, ask questions as they come in. All right, I think Marsha is going to take over for a number of slides now, so I'll pass the mic over. All right, thanks. Um, if you want to know where to get verification for your office, uh, we, we used to have a link up to the local um, CRG map page. We're encouraged to use the VLAB page from the CRSU. They have a verification portal here. All of the offices are available. It links directly to your verification, and if you want to find aviation verification, you're set up with a link on the left-hand menu. And on this page, that very top link where it says CRG map verification, in an upcoming tech note, that link will get changed to actually point to the, the VLAB site. Right now, it's pointing to this um, the Google site site. They, most of the links still work on the Google sites, location, but um, that's going to be phased out and hope we'll be keeping these links that Marsh is on right now um, up to date as best as possible. And so these links are available in this PowerPoint that will be sent out by Brian at the end of today. Also it's linked in the, or this PowerPoint is available in the CRDOS toolbox. All right, so moving on. Many offices are involved with digital or are involved with the forecast builder test bed. There's 10 central region offices in the official test bed. The rest of the offices get to have forecast builder populate in the background, um, but they handle their weather grids still um, in, a, in the original way. All right, so MKX is in the test bed. Many op, many. Um, Forecasters have asked me, hey, Marcia, how do I get digital aviation services to run with Forecast Builder? I see at the end of Forecast Builder, there's an option to have check marks to be able to run aviation populate and aviation finalize. But what do I, how do I handle the visibility? Um, and how do I handle, like, fog, as, you know, with the pot fog grid? I have a short answer for this for now and then I'll get into what, what we can look forward to. For now, I recommend just running Forecast Builder, and then at the end, like in your pot fog part of it, maybe do your visibility grids first, okay? Then when you're running a uh, Forecast Builder in the pot fog section, go ahead and run that with the defaults, but then rerun it for your short-term time period and say pot from visibility. There's actually, if you right click on the map 
and your pot fog grid map, um, you'll be able to find pot from visibility. It's a tool embedded in there. And uh, that can help you kind of jive your fog with your, um, your pot fog and get it all in the weather grid so that when you run your task, it's all in there together. But this opens up a window of opportunity for the forecast builder and digital aviation services to uh, create a better marriage, if you will, merge together. Um, so the CRG mat is working on this. Um, maybe one thought would be put visibility as part of the foundation grid, and then why not put cloud-based primary as that as well. The other thing is Forecast Builder handles the period beyond the ESTF or beyond our task period, basically. And so um, CRG Matt is looking at, well, how, what time range are we going to be running Forecast Builder and, and stuff like that. Um, I like to experiment with Forecast Builder. It works out really well using it in the short term as well. So I want them all to work together. We're probably going to uh, wrap some of the components of Aviation Populate and Aviation Finalize right into Forecast Builder. So look for these updates. Um, some of them are slated for January, but others will come out as, as we can get them at a later date. Um, if you have suggestions, questions, or um, things that you want, please email the Forecast Builder group or, or add it to the, um, the feedback form because they need your input and they need your suggestions. We're all starting at ground zero for all this. All right, and I also get a lot of questions about Aviation Finalize or say, people saying, hey, um, my visibility was wiped out when I ran Aviation Finalize. Why did this happen? Um, so I just want to go through what all Aviation Finalized does. It's all in the documentation that's available in the CR DOS toolbox. So for example, here's the CR DOS toolbox. There's this CR DOS overview um, document. And it's really a one-stop shop. You should be able to find anything you need to know about digital aviation services in this document. Anything we've been adding or updating, I've been updating in this document. So it's available in the presentation and on the CR DOS toolbox. But let me point out just a few things I've been noticing. I've getting repeated, I've been getting repeated questions about. Came up earlier in the in the talk today already. Um, we only edit our cloud-based primary grids, or of course your cloud-based secondary, cloud-based conditional. You don't ever edit the ceiling grids. Aviation Finalize handles making our ceiling grids by or looking at our sky grids and our cloud-based primary to make our ceilings. Aviation Finalize also handles interpol interpolation. So let's say you delete a few grids here and there to uh, make the ceilings come down at a different pace from what Consort gave you as a starting point or whatever model you chose. Um, Aviation Finalize will do all interpolation. That includes even changes you make with the winds or um, all sorts of things. OK, so now, um, so Aviation Finalize is designed to make ensure internal consistency. In addition, there are some visibility checks that are built in so that we have this consistency. One thing is that it checks to see what's in the weather grids to decide, well, will it keep your visibility at a lower level than 7SM? Well, um, the way you, there's an easy button here. All you have to do when you run Aviation Finalize, let's say your visibility grids were pretty low because you're thinking there's going to be radiation fog tonight and you like what's in your visibility grids, so you want your weather grids to align with that. That's very easy. You just you have to check mark fog from visibility, yes, in your aviation finalized GUI. This will change your weather grids. It'll add patchy fog, areas of fog, widespread fog. You can change these slider bars to make it less sensitive to fog, no problem. 
Um, having patchy fog in your in your weather grid is really no big deal. P a lot of people are worried about the public being over forecast by fog or something like that. Honestly, public perception, they're going to see that there's a little bit of haze in the air. Even if it's not impacting their driving, if it's greater than one mile fog, they're still going to say, if they saw in the, in the NDSC or in your zone or whatever, it's a point and click, it says patchy fog, and they see some reduction in visibility, they'll be like, oh, okay, whatever, you know, and move on. I don't, I think we overanalyze, like, the too much fog idea, so please don't worry about that. Um, another thing is, what if you have low visibility because of precipitation, say snow or something? Um, but you're, you only have chance or scattered snow showers in your forecast. Well, your visibility is going to be set to 7SM then because of our consistency checks. You have to have either likely, numerous, or definite in your weather grid. It's not looking at your pops. It's looking at the weather string, all right? The thing is, um, it won't handle what is the corresponding with your chance pops. It, it says that it's not enough certainty to have the reduced visibility. So if you want, if you think there's going to be reduction in visibility due to scattered snow showers, you should probably say snow showers likely. That's just uh, little tidbits here and there. We'll open it up for questions at the end. So the CRDOS toolbox is available. Brian's going to send out the link once again with the presentation, with the recorded. The recordings are available in this folder to go back and look at previous ones, too. Um, you're all encouraged to sign into VLAB. VLAB is where we have um, a place where you can put in your ideas, your feedback, put your questions in there. You can always email me or Jerry with questions as well. Um, but VLAB is a way to have, that has like a questions answer forum that's very slick. All right, and so in the future, digital aviation services will continue to evolve. We're going to, I mean, the national level is working on evolving digital aviation services as well. Central region is working hard with the national level to um, kind of correlate everybody and funnel, funnel everybody into the same direction. And eventually, the whole country is going to be doing digital aviation services the same way. And just you know, be aware that, yes, we're all going down the right path, the same path, and it, it will happen. Um, everyone's kind of going at their own pace at the moment, but um, just know that it's all in the works to be, to be one at some point. Uh, GSD is leading us in that direction with getting standardized task formatter, eventually standardized tools. Um, one thing that I'm going to ask the GSD task formatter developers to do is make sure that low-level wind shear does not show up in our task formatter below a certain threshold. Um, right now, in our outer periods of our tasks, low-level wind shear is interpolated because Consort becomes like a three-hour grid in the latter period. And so there's interpolation. You go from zero low-level wind shear up to 30 knots. So at some point, you've got 10 knots, 20 knots that's actually showing up in the task formatter. Obviously, we don't need to be putting that in the formatter. So we're going to work on getting that coded out of there. Um, Cloud-based primary does not round, or it actually rounds a lot, actually, to the nearest um, uh, flight category, if you will. So we're going to take that out to in you know, a future formatter build. Um, the diurnal queue, you've heard how we've been addressing the addressing diurnal queue problems with Consort and why there is the issues that arise just because models don't forecast feelings. The national blend model is going to hopefully be able to have a better design to handle this, as Jerry was saying. And then we're going to be working with forecast builder team to get digital aviation services wrapped into it really easily. Um, now, Patrick Ide is on the line, and he's, he's in the 
Central Region Grid Methodology Advisory Team. Of course, this team has a big, a big um, presence in development for programs across Central Region. Patrick, are you are you on the call? Are you able to? Are we able to hear you? Yes, I'm here. I've broken away from our uh, ongoing winter storm for for a few minutes. Uh, everyone, hear me? I can hear you just fine. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Thank you, Marsha. Well, Marsha, thanks for uh, again for putting all this together and all the efforts you do, and also for uh, um, for Jerry and and his um, um, expertise in 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 the, the coding and providing all these data sets to us. Um, really, you know, indispensable uh, person as well in this whole process. Like uh, Marsha was talking, touching on a few points, and I just kind of want to get on on some of them, maybe in a little bit more detail, especially as we move forward, as we look forward towards. A couple of years down the road, especially as we move FY18 and 19, um, where are we going? Um, there are several um, challenges uh, to, to meeting those goals um, that we uh, are currently working out with the CRG Matt and uh, you know RLC stuff as well. Um, one is you know for that to continue to evolve, and where do we want it to evolve to, and at what at what speed and what pace. Um, so from where, where we currently are, um, our, our operations in the central region, where we want to get to, which would be you know, where we're treating amendments over a whole domain. We're, we're not just um, you know, especially running these, um, these groups just at our routine times, but, but dynamically updating them continuously uh, to provide uh, flight uh, planning information between the TAF sites um, continuously. So that, that is uh, where we want to go um, eventually down the road. Um, how are we going to get there? Uh, well, we have to look at the ESTF process and how do we get uh, DAS um, uh, further integrated into Forecast Builder. Um, do we want to start making some of these DAS grids uh, part of the foundation grids? Um, you know, part of it is also the ESTF process, uh, how that gets uh, enveloped and uh, evolved in Forecast Builder and how we continue to uh, probably reinvigorate that ESTF effort that was introduced several years ago. I think it's coming back into light now of how we need to uh, continue to evolve that because that will be hand in hand with, with digital aviation of how we kind of marry both of them together. Uh, there's certainly uh, technology things to, to look at, um, you know, like Marshall was touching on uh, visibility. You know, how do we make that more intelligent and, and more sophisticated with interacting with the other grids and the other grids interacting with it? Um, another thing, uh, especially as we move, you know, FY18 and, and 19, uh, is the uh, fully integrated field structure, um, and how do we uh, the, the the fields interact with uh, AWC um, and the the MBM? So the plans are, you know, AWC testing is continuing their development of, of their own uh, of, of digital aviation sea land visibility grids. They have certain FAA requirements that need to be met um, for cloud layers. And so they, their methodology for uh, digital aviation is a little bit different uh, in, compared to us. We have you know, cloud-based primary and ceiling. They have cloud-based scattered, cloud-based view, and then uh, cloud-based ceiling. So one challenge is how to um, meld those two together uh, down the road. Um, how do we test uh, that interaction with the AWC and interacting with the field? Um, and then, you know, where does the MBM fit in, into all this? So those are some things that are, are coming down the road that we're continuing to uh, to work out as a, as a CRG map, um, as uh, also the consistency team, also with Marsha and Brian's help, um, and then, you know, our, our partners at, at AWC. So. There's uh, a lot going on, a lot of challenges, uh, certainly not insurmountable. We're certainly working on, on those solutions, but that kind of uh, maybe gives a little bigger picture of, of where we want to go, uh, continue to, to make uh, DAS uh, fully operational. Um, you know, we need to figure out things both uh, locally, regionally, and, and nationally as well. So that's, that's kind of the, the broader vision um, and challenges that we're, we are currently working on. All right. Thank you very much, Patrick. Good luck with that winter storm. Uh, thanks. So we appreciate it. Bring it on. <laughs> All right. So um, Brian Hirsch did a kind of a facelift to the status spreadsheet for digital aviation services across Central Region. 
all the offices are listed on here, and only um, only a small portion of them are listed as operational. If your office is actually operational and not just testing, please feel free to come into this spreadsheet, which is linked in the presentation here, um, to be able to update what your status is. Also, feel free to add web page links, documentation, update the names for the points of contact. Brian, did you want to add to, any, add to this at all? No, that was excellent. I, I appreciate you calling it a facelift. Essentially, we just need to um, begin to tighten up our um, uh, the language that we're using because so many people are becoming operational. We'd like to see your dates as to when you plan to or when you have. And uh, if you're struggling, I don't know that there's a struggling category, um, but uh, if, if you feel like you need some help, uh, feel free to send uh, uh, myself or Marsha uh, an email and say, hey, you know, uh, maybe in the new year in January, we would like to, you know, be looking at, at uh, uh, where, where our program is and, um, you know, get on to the testing route. So those are, uh, uh, those are some things. I will be sending out the recordings as well as a, a link to the spreadsheet uh, after today's call. And um, so uh, just really appreciate everyone updating this. And then we'll be able to get this to the uh, national folks so that um, they're, out, they're also able to track our, process, our progress. So thank you. All right, thanks. And that is all we have for our presentation today. This is our time to take questions. We're almost at one hour. Brian, have there been any people raising their hands? If you, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, I do see one hand raised, and I would like to uh, unmute their line here. Um, but uh, uh, please go ahead and raise your, raise your hands. We can go back through uh, if we've missed a, a portion that you'd like to discuss. Um, for right now, um, uh, Cami Sims from headquarters, I've unmuted your line if you'd like to speak. And hi, everyone. Thanks. Uh, so my hand has a mind of its own and just likes to go up. <laughs> it anticipates I have questions or something. I don't know. But anyway, since uh, I have the and like I'll just say hi to everyone and um, you know echo what what Brian just said if anyone has questions or struggling with digital aviation I will say from things that I've heard in the field sometimes you take one step forward and two steps back with an office and implementing DAS and sometimes that can be frustrating and um, you just want to move forward but some, that is pretty common um, to take a step forward and two steps back and then you know kind of regroup and take another step forward um, sometimes three times, it takes three times to get going. So um, another thing I'll, I'll echo too, um, Patrick did a great job reviewing what's going on at AWC and I know some offices have been concerned about their path moving forward and from the latest I hear from AWC and the feedback from all of the forecasters that they received from the field, they're going to be trying to do their best to accommodate their users and what they need in doing the few scattered broken overcast grids. Um, but also playing along the same lines of what you guys need in the field and not complicating your lives more. So more to come on that. No, no answers necessarily at this point, but they're going to kind of go back and regroup and try to mesh what they need with what you guys need um, so that way it's a little bit less confusing once it's all incorporated together. So um, again, thanks, thanks to Marsha and Jerry and Brian and all of your great work at Central Region. Um, I'm here to support anything you need from the national level, and um, great job, and I'll go back on mute. Okay, um, thank you. Um, we do have uh, uh, one other uh, uh, question here. Um, Jennifer, if I unmute your line, you're unmuted. Would, uh, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Um, I wasn't sure if my microphone would work, so I just wanted to test it real quick. We're hearing you, and you you sound uh, you sound good. Awesome. Um, we have been looking at um, snow uh, using snow in the grids, and then having the lower visibilities. Um, we know if you ha you have to have the definite or um, numerous or likely chances for snow, but what are those thresholds uh, for the visibility when you uh, run the finalized tool? 
we noticed that it would um, I would have maybe two miles or a mile with that definite chance for snow. But when I ran the finalized tool, it would actually raise your visibility up to five miles. And I wasn't sure why or what the thresholds were with that. Hi, Jennifer. Um, OK, you caught Jerry and I off guard on that one. We are not aware of any, anything in the programming that would do that. It, if you have definite snow, it shouldn't touch your visibility at all. OK. Yeah, I, de I tested, I, we actually had um, a comment about it happening over the weekend, so I tested it this morning just um, in practice mode to see what it would give me. And sure enough, when I ran the finalized tool with my definite snow chances, it took away the visibilities I'd had and categorized them, but it increased them across the board uh, for the entire area. So I was kind of baffled as to why it would do that for a definite chance. So. Jennifer, what office did you say you were? Topeka. Topeka. Um, could you do me a favor and make sure that you have your latest GSE configuration uploaded to the central server? And I'm going to download your configuration and see if I can see anything awry in your, your tools and procedures. OK, we'll do that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I don't know whether to ask, um, Cami, is that a, a special feature that you have have heard about? I, I think so. I think it just anticipates, I don't know, maybe I ask a lot of questions and it just anticipates I always have questions. I don't know. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I keep trying to turn it off, but for some reason it always comes like I have no idea. If anyone knows how to fix it, <laughs> message me. <laughs> Thank you, though. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Are there any additional questions uh, from the field? Otherwise, I don't know if I can uh, uh, presume upon um, uh, Marsha and Jerry to take us to um, some live data from today. Yeah, sure. I remember we were talking about that when we were getting set up. So uh, we saw the national blend of models output in the top right screen. This is actually what I was thinking about doing, say, if I'm going to click on 15Z, don't see anything there. We're a little behind you here. Um, so uh, there we go. Now we see your screen. <laughs> we have incredible bandwidth today. Yeah, it doesn't look good. Not what I clicked on. All right. Well, anyway, Brian, I think that I think we are done. I mean, we've okay. shown people where verification is. If you want a snapshot of our 60-day verification at MKX, we can we can do that. You know where to spy on all your neighbors and how to see how their verification is doing. I could in in our last call, I ran through some of this verification and to show how people could use it. Did you want me to do that, Brian? If, if you're able, I don't know if the bandwidth will support. We do currently see your 60-day cloud uh, base uh, primary verification. All right. So basically, um, what I, in the last call, we sort of went over certain ways you can use this. So in here, you can see that uh, GLAMP MELD obviously is performing pretty well over, our, over the past 60 days. And, Conshore SD is up there too. Um, the differences, again, you see they're not all that huge, um, but there are some differences. Um, one way that I could envision using this, this, this you know, on a day-to-day on -day basis is, you know, our forecast office you know, obviously is starting with a consistent starting point, and then they're they're improving on it. And so, what are they doing to improve on it? Um, what you could do is you could look at Conshort and come up here and try to get an idea as to where Conshort isn't behaving the best. And click on your model and it will load and then you can come down to the, the contingency tables. And in here um, you can get a sort of brief idea of what Conshort is doing or you know what any model is doing in reality. Um, and this sort of is telling me 
the blue here is saying that there's a bit of a tendency to over forecast, so to, to forecast a little bit too high. Um, so you might want to say, okay, I'm going to use kind of short and then look at how the path verification is going. And if, if you tend to lean on it going a little bit lower, this might give you confidence that, yeah, kind of short is forecasting a little too high for these types of um, categories. I'm going to go a little bit lower. I'm going to lower the category. Um, so it, that, that would be a way that I could envision using this. Um, you know, there's lots of different stats you can get. Uh, this percent too high, percent too low, um, that sort of gets at, again, um, what these contingency tables are. I think the percent too high is basically the blue, and the percent too low is the red. Um, you can look at any number of your sites by, eventually this will be the correct length, but right now it's um, pointing to our G, GMAT site. And again, it's taking forever. Um, but you can click on that, and that would theoretically take you to a site that looks like this. And then you can say you want to look at lacrosse, um, since they're our neighbor of ours. Then you can click on the aviation verification, and again, get the same information from them, and see how how the models are performing at your neighbors, um, how they're performing. Um, so I'm not going to really get into picking on um, ARX, um, but I mean, you can I guess right there you could see that GLAMP meld wasn't up there, so maybe they're missing GLAMP meld. Um, I don't see a lot of kind of short models either, so um, there, you know, that, that could be something that would need to be looked at, um, and it could just be that they're not verifying quite as well too. So. Um, but the fact you know, that con short isn't appearing might mean that the GLAMP meld is not. Uh, coming in, and that's that's what makes Conshort suffer. Is that, that correct? Could very well be. Yeah. Um, another. Yeah, Conshort. Here it is. So it, it, they they do have it. So it's just lower on the the, the spectrum. Um, another idea here is I was asked this in the last one. Um, what is, what all is being used? Um, the default is for sites to set up their task sites. Um, or just their airports, or a we here at MKX are looking at all ASOS, AWOS points. Um, that's the default. Um, then you can also do a true gridded verification and do your entire CWA. Um, what I found is, interestingly enough, the verification, at least here at MKX, doesn't change substantially. There is some changes, and obviously here it did change a little bit more, because um, now you can see Con Short's actually stepped up and performing a little bit better, but at the individual sites, um, it doesn't necessarily perform quite as well. Um, so um, th that's just a couple ways you can use it. Um, you can uh, you can do lots of you know days, you can do 180 up to 180 days. I capped it here at 90. Um, so anyhow, if anybody had any questions, I can dig further in um, to you know how some of these stats are made or whatever. Okay, and the last thing that I will add is that you can either change the, the period uh, on the top of the table to up to 180 days, or um, uh, sometimes I will change it in the actual web link, um, the actual address above. So you can set it for any, um, uh, really any uh, time frame that you like. Uh, because we have been doing this for so long now, uh, we have a long uh, uh, history. Um, in the database. The only reason to keep it to 60 days at this time, uh, I believe we spoke earlier, which uh, w was because there was a change in um, uh, in the formulation of con short. Is that correct? Yeah, and that's sort of when I started the um, standard deviation stuff here at MKX. Um, there's, there's some specific checks in there to make sure you have a certain percentage of the model available, um, like on the dates that it's available. But, you know, I think it's only 30% of the time it has to be available to be included in the stats. So, you know, we, I, like, I like to sort of make sure that we have a direct one-to-one -one verification um, so that, you know, all the models were available for the whole time frame there. And that's why we've been keeping it to around 60 days here for now. But obviously that, you know, every day that gets bigger and bigger. Okay. I see no other hands raised, and uh, so with that, um, I'll thank you, Jerry, for running through the verification.
um, even if you're not doing uh, and editing the grids every day, that verification runs every day, and there is some good information there to uh, uh, to learn about your bias. Uh, as forecasters, and also the um, individual bias at uh, for uh, uh, for the models that you may be looking at. So please be looking at those, um, and uh, uh, and thank you, Marsha, for uh, going through all of the different tools. Um, I think there are some really good explanations that you've given that I may even cut out uh, individually if I can make the uh, recording cooperate and. Uh, uh, just to maybe even add a, uh, uh, a greatest hits uh, portion from this. So with that, um, I'm going to thank everybody for attending today's call uh, and wish everyone a happy new year. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, everybody.